Our second speaker today is Terry Geis. Um, Geis is research assistant at the Los Angeles Museum, County Museum of Art, where she is working on a major exhibition on women artists and surrealism. Prior to joining LACMA, she earned her doctorate from the University of Essex. Her recent publications focus on Mexican art, women artists, and surrealism in Mexico and Paris. And a forthcoming co-authored chapter will address the influence of indigenous art on women surrealists in Mexico and the United States. Her paper is entitled, I believed that I long dreamed I was free, Maria Martins and surrealism in the 1940s. Good morning. The sculpture of the Brazilian artist Maria Martins was a significant element of surrealism as it developed in the United States in the 1940s and in post-war Paris, appearing in key projects of the time, including the journal VVV, or Triple V, as some would call it, in 1944, and in the International Surrealist Exhibition in Paris in 1947. With an inspiration in myths and syncretic rituals, of the indigenous and Afro-Brazilian populations of her country, Martine's work was essential to the surrealist regroupings in and navigation of the new world during exile. This is a photograph up on the screen of Martine's in her studio in New York in around 1946. She is surrounded by many of the works for which she is best known now, including Impossible, which is all the way over on the far right, and The Road, The Shadow, Too Long, Too Narrow, which is the title of another piece, which is the large plaster that you see in the center of the image. In a wonderful bit of photographic symbolism, just peeking out over Martine's head is a photograph of Marcel Duchamp. As art historians Francis Nauman and Michael Taylor have discussed in recent years, Martine's was romantically involved with Duchamp in the 1940s and 50s, and served as a model for the body molds of his Etant Donné. As this paper will examine, Martins' sculpture was also important to André Breton during the 1940s, becoming part of his dialogue on freedom, connection and transformation through nature and water, as seen in his efforts to create a new myth based around the idea of the great transparence. Angela Miller has written of surrealism's emphasis during this time, quote, evolutionary transformation, cycles of life and death, destructive and creative forces, these were the focus of the new forms of the mythic narrative. These were also the key concepts Martins was exploring, at first on her own, and then within the surrealist circle. Often referring to the figures in her sculptures as her monsters, Martins had the ability, as one historian has put it, to give form to the unimaginable. Martins' sculpture and its reception by the Surrealists created a dialogue on freedom from many perspectives, political liberation from colonialism, freedom to experiment with new sculptural form, rebirth and transformation in the face of the horrors of the Second World War, and perhaps most prominently, sexual freedom. There is an underlying irony to the story of Martins and the Surrealists in the 1940s, which must be mentioned, and that is her role as the wife of the Brazilian ambassador to the United States, Carlos Martins. In her capacity as a diplomatic spouse, Maria Martins represented the Estado Novo of the dictator Getulio Vargas, which at certain points had maintained as its political base the Brazilian integralists who adopted fascist and Nazi symbolism and accompanying anti-Semitic rhetoric. However, there is absolutely no evidence that Martins held such beliefs herself, and her marriage to Carlos Martins allowed her a tremendous expansion of personal freedom. Unlike the penniless, persecuted surrealist exiles in the 1940s, Martins' position allowed her to widely travel, closely connect with world leaders, influence political policy, and in terms of her art career, 
promote her work in ways that were quite extraordinary for a woman artist at the time. Martine's connection to the Surrealists is thought to have begun in around 1943, when she exhibited a series of sculptures at the Valentine Gallery in New York. Interestingly enough, alongside the paintings of Piet Mondrian, it's quite a contrast, as you'll see. Martine's sculptures were based upon indigenous myths of deities of the Amazon, which at times she mixed with Afro-Brazilian gods. A limited edition book of photographs of Martine's sculptures, each accompanied by her dramatic poetic descriptions of the figures, was published for the exhibition, a copy of which is here at the Getty, and this is the cover of the book. The cover features a map of the Amazon. The earth is a vivid green, although it's hard to see from this photograph that I took, but it's a very bright green cover. And the river is very red, like veins running through a body. Each sculpture and accompanying tale is based upon the highly sexualized and violent creation and destruction myths of river, forest, woman, and snake, which are all interlinked. The predominant motif is that of the horrific siren goddesses who seduce and then consume their victims. This sculpture, Amazonia, depicts the annual union of the river and earth, which occurs symbolically in the copulation of the river snake and a woman in order to replenish the forest. The sea is born of Jemenja's incestuous relationship with her son, which she is doomed to repeat with all men of the sea, intoxicating them with, as Martins wrote, her shimmering hair, seaweed of all the oceans. One of the most striking and horrific of the series is the Cobra Grande, the great snake, described by Martins as goddess over all of the Amazonian deities. Mother of the river Amazon, she lives in a palace at the bottom of the river. Martins creates one of her finest monsters here, a bizarre androgynous snake with four large breasts. And I'll show you a close up here. Uh, Cobra Grande is of course also slang for the, it's a slang term for penis. The sculptures are abundantly, almost grotesquely busy in their textures and elaborate interweaving of nude goddesses, snakes, and plant life. And the works, especially when reproduced in photograph, bear a certain resemblance to surrealist practices of automatism, as can be seen, for example, in Andre Masson's work. In 1947, Breton would write an essay on Martine's work for a solo exhibition she held at the Julian Levy Gallery stating that she was the rising star of surrealism in the new world. In their interwoven forms and the seemingly natural connections of the patterns of plant life, rocks, fossils, perhaps crystals, it is no surprise that Martine's work would appeal to Breton, who would note that the basis of her work seemed not to consist in wax, but of sap. In the early 1940s, Martine's had been studying with Jock Lipschitz, who taught her the lost wax technique, and this became the means through which she was able to articulate an immediacy and urgency in her forms. In the late 1960s, in an interview with Clarisse Lispector, Martins would describe her working technique, praising the lost wax method as that which could, quote, take you to infinity because it had no limits. Martins would mix beeswax into the material for greater malleability, and then with that, she was able to work very freely with great immediacy of expression. Upon first viewing her sculpture at the Valentine Gallery in 1943, Breton would already have had some awareness of the themes she, that she was exploring, some framework on Brazil and its black and indigenous peoples, their cultures, and the dimensions of their oppression. Between 1929 and 1931, Benjamin Pere had lived in Brazil and published a series of 13 articles on Macumba rituals in an effort to highlight the marginalization of Afro-Brazilians and also to provocatively encourage a rebellion. Due to his writing and political activities, Pere was eventually arrested and expelled from Brazil in a decree signed by the dictator Vargas himself, who we recall would be Martine's husband's boss. Another important source on Brazil for, Bre for Breton would be Cloud Levy Strauss. On the boat which would take both men into exile in the United States in 1941, it is well known that the two conducted a rigorous exchange of ideas. 
during which time Levi Strauss was deeply concerned about the safe passage of his suitcases full of materials related to his recent years of field work in Brazil and the Amazon. Years later, Levi Strauss would recall a conversation that he had had in the 1930s with the Brazilian ambassador in Paris, who told him, and I quote, Indians, alas, my dear sir, they all disappeared years ago. This is a very sad, very shameful episode of my country. As a sociologist, you will discover fascinating things in Brazil, but forget about the Indians, you won't come across a single one, unquote. If this was the official stance of the Brazilian government, which Levi Strauss believes it was, and if Pere was expelled from the country in part for his examination of Afro-Brazilian culture, then Martin's sculpture could be read not simply as folkloric nationalist celebration, but as her means of instigating a rebellion from within. The sculpture that would strike an especially strong chord of significance with Breton and others by Martins is this work, Macumba. Breton would describe this work as, quote, a hymn to the god of spasm himself, in which the flesh, yielding like the bud of a flower, becomes impregnated with all the strange dendritic markings of the native metal. Exhibited in Martins' third exhibition at the Valentine Gallery in 1944, an image of the sculpture was published in the same year in the fourth journal of this, in the fourth issue of the surrealist journal Triple V. And this is the cover of that issue. <laughs> My boyfriend told me not to leave this image up on the screen too long because it could distract you all. <laughs> but I'll leave it up. Um, this issue would end up being the final of the journal, which has been described as reflecting a growing diversification of the surrealist movement. Perhaps this was in part due to Perret's scathing criticism of the previous issue of Triple V, which came out in 1943, which he described in a letter to, from Mexico to Breton as, as bland as a book of floral patterns. Issue four would feature a blend of violence, nature, and sexuality as expressions of rebellion against repression, as seen through the work of artists from Latin America and the Caribbean. The journal featured this cover by M Mata of the Vagina Dentata, and inside was a photo of the poet Aimé Césaire and his poem Batouk, alongside Martine's sculpture, followed by a photograph of Grifedo Lamb in front of his major painting, The Jungle. Martins Macumba depicts a scene of an Afro-Brazilian ritual with three figures in a state of ecstatic trance, their heads slumping to one side. The central figure is male, the shaman who facilitates through dancing and drumming the trance state among initiates in order to talk to the spirits. Uh, below, although it's possibly not entirely clear from this image, I hope it is. Below there's a rooster playing music on a guitar, uh, perhaps symbolic of the animal sacrifice performed by the shaman in order to smear blood over new initiates to the ritual. The figures are connected to an abstracted landscape which seems to deeply inform and reflect their practices. Placed in connection with Césaire's poem, Batouk, Martin's sculpture operates as a symbol of both political liberation and a return to analogical thought. Batouk would eventually be published in 1946 as part of Césaire's book, The Miraculous Weapons. This series, in which the poet reclaimed the African presence of both his own Martinique and the wider black diaspora, has been described as incorporating automatic writing techniques, utilizing around 40 words that are continually repeated in contrast to each other. Night, day, sun, water, blood, revolt, madness, logic. The image of Martin's Macumba should also be read in continuity with Mata's cover image of the Vahina Dentata. This common motif for the surrealists, symbol of the monstrous feminine, developed interesting new associations through Martin's sculpture, with the open mouths of the figures in Macumba mirrored in their gaping open breasts and bellies. The surrealists likely also saw broader connections to the Vahina Dentata in Martin's body of work, with its themes of the Amazon River and sexual goddesses who are half woman, half sea creature. As related by Eric Neumann, 
A significant version of the vacuna dentata myth is that in which, and I quote, a fish inhabits the vagina of the terrible mother. The hero is the man who overcomes the terrible mother, breaks the teeth out of her vagina, and so makes her a woman. To return to Martine's Amazonia series, here on the right is another from the series called Boina. This is the goddess Boina, described by Martine's as the monster snake, the genius of evil. She comes silently in her silver galley, and I quote, this boat is made of the plunder of thousands of funerals, of the tatters and shrouds of thousands of beings. Boina carries out her murders through her, and I quote, innumerable mouths sucking their blood, draining their strength. The sculpture's largest mouth is, of course, the area between her legs, which is pointed like sharp teeth. As expressed in this triple V sequence of artists from Latin America and the Caribbean, Breton's ideals of liberation in the 1940s were tied to a combination of nature and sexuality as written across the landscape and rivers of the Americas, connected at times to the bodies of women. And as you can see, Martine's monsters fit very well into these concepts. In general, however, such associations are problematic and were at times heavily criticized, as can be seen, for example, in the response of René Menil in Martinique to Breton and Masson's writings about the island, which were published once they arrived in New York. Menil's objections would be associated with debates at the time regarding exoticism and nature. As Maria Clara Bernal has written, while Breton and Masson would be criticized as perpetuating a colonializing exoticism, Césaire had also conceived of plants and nature as a symbol of African spirituality and was never openly attacked by his colleagues for this. It appears, as Bernal has written, that, one of, that it was one thing to hear from a local that liberation would come through fertile nature when it could be regarded as an anti-colonial strategy. It was another to hear it from a foreigner, including the surrealists, when it could be regarded basically as colonial thought. Benjamin Perret would demonstrate an understanding of these complexities and sensitivities in specific relations to Martine's when in 1956 he would write an essay on her work and he would state, quote, nothing evokes nature's expression as well as, Mart as Maria's work does. Not that a direct link can be made between one and the other, but mainly because the way she, in which she treats the material resembles nature itself. Martine's work, with its emphasis on myths of water, sexuality, hybrid beings that meld into the forest, would specifically have resonated with Breton due to his concept of the great transparence, as first outlined in his third manifesto, which appeared in Triple V in June of 1942. Breton would write of these transparent hidden beings that could form his new myth, and I quote, man is perhaps not the center of the universe. One may go so far as to believe that there exists above him on the animal level, beings whose behavior is as alien to him as his own must be to the day fly or the whale. There is nothing that would necessarily prevent such beings from completely escaping his sensory frame of reference since these beings might avail themselves of a type of camouflage, which no matter how you imagine it becomes plausible when you consider the theory of form and what has been discovered about mimetic animals. In his manifesto, Breton would specifically call out Césaire's poetry as part of the surrealist project in the New World and would refer somewhat mysteriously to, quote, a marvelous young woman who at this very moment beneath the shadow of her lashes is walking around the great ruined chalk boxes of South America. As Angela Miller has noted, the call to myth by Breton and other exiled surrealists would lead to some accusations that the movement was mirroring the right wing in a reactionary mystification of underlying social problems. However, Miller asserts that Breton, wary of, and I quote, the fascistic misuses of myth would attack fascism with its own instruments through a collective counter-myth. Here's an interesting image of Martine's that relates her strongly to this counter-myth of the great transparence. This image appeared in Vogue in 1944. Keeping in mind Duchamp's previous work for the magazine, 
It has been suggested by Francis Nauman and others that he may have been responsible for this layout that you see. Martins peers out at the pieces of jewelry that she has cast, marvelous creatures which hover on a transparent screen resembling hybridized insect, flower, and sea creature beings. Martins is presented as a visionary who can bring forth the unseen, or as Breton would put it in his essay on her work, quote, the virgin regions where unconsumed, brand new forces of the future are lurking. Perret's essay on Martins would further tie her work to the great transparence. He wrote, I have no doubt that Maria's works foretell a world that does not yet exist, unless our world is growing in other invisible dimensions, but under what heavens? In her work, the three realms intermingle, condense, and complete one another, like mimetic insects that establish a link between captive plants and modal beings. If Martins' sculpture, was key to Breton's countermyth, and some detractors in the US loudly accused him of enacting an alliance with fascism in his thinking, it must be repeated that it is no little irony that Carlos Martins represented the Brazilian dictatorship of Vargas, which had at times aligned itself with the fascist leaders of Europe. However, the surrealists, even Pere, who had been expelled from Brazil by Vargas, didn't seem to have been especially concerned with this. By 1944, after viewing Martin's Amazonia exhibitions, Breton's concept of the great transparence would at times be associated with water deities. For example, they provide a central motif within his Arcanum 17. Within the tarot, the Arcanum 17 is the morning star, the light of hope that comes after the cataclysmic death and destruction found within previous cards. The star is depicted as a young goddess who, holds two with, who with two urns pours the water of the ocean and the rivers, a symbol of regeneration. Within Breton's text, this deity at times transforms into Melusina, a water sprite of French lore depicted as half woman and half snake or fish from the waist down. Melusina has been described as the perfect symbol of Breton's image of woman as key to humanity's reemergence after fascism. And Breton would write, and I quote, she's the one I invoke. She's the only one I can see who can redeem this savage epoch. While Breton's deities interestingly mirror Martin's sculpture, his conclusions are rather different. What is a savior destructor goddess in Martin's, a, a praying mantis in Fahina Dentata, becomes in Arcanum 17 that figure which has been so problematic to many art historians examining the roles of women in surrealism, the femme enfant. Breton's vision of Melusina transforms as he reflects, her arms are the soul of streams that sing and float perfumes, and under the landslide of her tarnished hair, all the distinctive traits of the femme enfant take shape, that distinctive type that has always conquered poets because time on her has no hold. Breton clearly did not see Martins herself as a femme enfant, however. She was not simply published in VVV and greatly admired by Breton and other surrealists, but became very closely involved with the movement in New York, actively participating in its projects and plans. For example, Steffi Kiesler's very detailed agenda book from the 1940s contains many entries on meetings with Martins, Frederick Kiesler, Duchamp, Miro, Mata, among others. While William Copley, in his unpublished memoir, Portrait of the Artist as a Young Art Dealer, recalls dining at the Matas with Martins in around 1947, and he recalls she was all energy. According to Copley, Martins and Mata were discussing their plans to launch a new single sheet magazine, which they would call Instead, and that, according to Copley, there was hysteria in the air. Following the Amazonia exhibition in 1943, Martine's sculpture began to change. Her forms began to simplify. Her themes became less concretely based on Brazilian myth and ritual. Returning to the two works that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, Martine's began to explore the transparent form of shadows, as in this work, The Road, The Shadow, Too Long, Too Narrow from 1946, where a menacing shadow creature with snakes emerging from its head stalks a woman walking on the road. 
Martine's also regularly examined the inability of people to connect, as seen in her best-known work, Impossible, made in different variations between 1944 and 1947, in which two figures attempt to make contact, but their spiked heads, which have often been described as looking like tentacles or Venus flytraps, but also greatly resemble the vagina dentata, get in the way. The continuing thread from Martine's Amazonia series to these would be eroticism, which she would reflect was, I quote, one of the paths for reaching final liberation. By 1946, Breton had returned to Paris and in collaboration with Duchamp, Kiesler, Enrico Donati, were planning the 1947 International Exhibition of Surrealism. Breton's great transparence would form the theme of the exhibition and include altars in a labyrinth devoted to, quote, a being, a category of beings, or an object, real or imaginary, capable of being endowed with a mythical life, such as the great transparence. The Donati papers, which are housed here at the Getty, contain letters from Breton related to the exhibition. This is a 1947 note from Breton outlining where each painter should be placed in connection to each sculptor. An arrow attaches Martines to Miro. Let's see if I can, oh, that's not what I meant to do. Well, you can find it on there. An arrow attaches Martines to Miro, is then crossed out, but in pencil at the bottom, Breton writes, okay, Massan, Mar Maria Martins, Miro. Martin's sculpture would be prominently featured in the exhibition in a room thought to have been designed by Duchamp called the Rain Room, in which curtains of water, which some have described as actually colored water, fell onto the floor of duckboards. This is an image of Martin's The Road, The Shadow, Too Long, Too Narrow, installed in the Rain Room. What can't be seen from this photo, the sculpture was placed directly under one of the curtains of water in order to create a continual rain over the piece. Given the significance of the waterfall in Duchamp's Etant Donnée, which he and Martins would have been secretly collaborating on by 1947, this installation can in part be seen as a private joke between the two. In the meantime, let's see if I can do it this time, her sculpture Impossible was placed in the center of the room on a billiard table. And at the beginning of the exhibition, when it opened, visitors were encouraged to use the table with provided cues and balls. Uh, these balls apparently were almost immediately stolen by the visitors. Throughout the, uh, through these installations, an intriguing contradiction was created between the exhibition's overall theme of an elusive, invisible transparent and the effort or, or freedom to make contact and touch Martine's sculpture whether through the flow of water onto metal or game playing by knocking billiard balls into cast bronze. This urge to make contact was also consistent with the exhibition's infamous catalog designed by Duchamp and Donati and featuring a mold of Martine's breast surrounded by black velvet and captioned on the back with the words, please touch. And this is also in, they, a copy of this is here at the Getty and it is quite wonderful to touch. <laughs> a plan for the exhibition's layout, also in the Donati papers here, specifically calls out the pool table, which is right there, but no other specific installations in the show, making clear how central it was to the project's overall conception. While Martine's work was central to the rain room, Duchamp and Breton were by no means segregating her from European peers in some sort of tropical rainforest replica. Within the online records of Breton's personal papers, there are photographs of Waldberg's sculptures with short notes on the back. It is unclear whether these were written by Duchamp or Breton, but they clearly discuss plans for the 1947 exhibition. One note indicates that Waldberg's sculptures should be related to Martine's The Road, The Shadow, Too Long, Too Narrow, and also mentions the significance of maritime charts to Waldberg's work. Exiled in New York during the war, Waldberg was also a close friend of Duchamp and began to create her delicate constructions out of beech branches, such as these that you see here, partially inspired by maritime stick maps of the Marshall Islands. 
The sculptures represented an effort to get away from form, a sort of transparent. Waldberg would later recall, quote, the air flowing inside the objects was the most important thing to me, and that these objects were an expression of my will to freedom. As the rain room demonstrates, Waldberg and Martins were both working with ideas of water, freedom, and the mapping of identity in the face of exile and life abroad, drawing inspiration from indigenous cultures, but with very different results. In 1948, Martins moved with her husband to Paris, and in the same year, she held a solo exhibition that continued to explore the concepts of the rain room, but making them her own. The catalog cover for the exhibition, which you see here, once again returned to the sculpture so key to Martine's reception. This is a shadow detail of Makumba presented as a fading and untouchable transparent. This image is in high contrast with Martine's message in the catalog, which urged visitors to touch the works. Martine's would write, Look and touch, find for yourself the lines of strength created by your confrontation, by them and by you. Take your chances between yourselves for better or for worse. Maria will interfere no more. The game is between the work and the viewer, for him and against him, join in. With these directives, Martins removed the previous intermediaries of contact of the rain room, water and billiard balls, and encouraged the visitor to experience her sculptures directly without intervention. Martins also offered a brief poetic explication for each piece in the show. So let's look at a couple of the sculptures, and in conclusion, we'll look at a few of the sculptures that were in the exhibition, these wonderful sculptures that Martins urged her visitors to touch, and we'll read a couple of her passages on her own concepts of freedom about these sculptures. To accompany this six foot tall sculpture, which is entitled, However, and in which a woman is tightly bound by snakes, one of which emerges out of her head, Mar Martins wrote, search for liberation. I hope she'll never free herself. It would be too sad. For the road, the shadow too long, too narrow, Martins wrote, we are followed by prejudice, by all that we have desired and did not accomplish. This is what prevents us from being really free. And in this related sculpture, which is called The Woman Has Lost Her Shadow, and she doesn't even have full snakes coming out of her head, just little baby snakes. Martins wrote about this piece. She freed herself so much that she even lost her shadow. She has nothing left. This is the great danger in liberation. We start becoming slaves to freedom. And in the sculpture, which is also called however, but it has three exclamation points at the end of it, so it's however, the bonds of the snake are loosened and large wings sprout from the figure's head, indicating a potential for freedom. Yet Martine's accompanying note concludes, freed a little in her mind, she still clings to the earth, and that's fortunate. With these passages, Martins presented freedom as a delicate and dangerous balancing act that is almost never achieved and likely never should be achieved. After her exhibition, Martins continued to participate in surrealist activities. For example, contributing this drawing to an issue of the 1949 surrealist journal, Neon, However, Martine's significant role among the Surrealists would begin to fade, as in 1949 she would permanently re return to Brazil after a lengthy absence of 20, over 20 years. She returned to Brazil, and it was the end of an era of sorts for Surrealism. The previous issue of Neon had announced Mata's excommunication from the group. However, it is clear that throughout the 1940s, Martine's had a deeply important impact on surrealism's path. Thank you.